Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. And welcome, everyone, for joining us in this SNEA Network Storage Forum sponsored presentation. In today's presentation, we'll be introducing notable updates to the NVMe over Fabric 1.1 specification. But before jumping in this presentation, I'd like to quickly cover a few BrightTalk user interface. Uh, first, some of the graphics and text from this presentation may be slightly small, so I'd recommend enlarging your viewing area to full screen. This can be accomplished by clicking on the double arrows in the lower right-hand corner of the presentation. I'd also like to encourage everyone to make this presentation interactive by asking questions of your presenters. You'll find a chat box also to the right-hand side of the window where you can type your questions to our presenters. We do have a full agenda today, and in order to ensure that this presentation completes on time, we will be postponing the questions to the end of the presentation. Similarly, oftentimes we have a, uh, such great participation that we cannot cover all the questions in the allotted presentation time. Due to this, we will be releasing a blog to the SNEA website that contains all the questions with the corresponding answers. Also, we frequently get requests for the presentation. You can find it down below in the Attachments and Links section within the Bright Talk user interface. There is a download there for you. Uh, finally, at the end of the presentation, we do request that you rate it um, when we are finished. Uh, you have an option of rating between 1 and 5, with 5 being the best. There are also comments and suggestion area, and we'd love to hear from you in that section as well. Your comments are valuable, as they will help us to improve the quality of future presentations. Real quick before we get started, a uh, quick introduction to everybody. My name is Tim Lustig. I'm going to be your moderator today. I, am, I work at NVIDIA as the uh, um, Ethernet Marketing Manager, promoting Ethernet, and also work with many of the industry associations. With me today I've got a, a large crew who are uh, highly qualified presenters and um, experts in their area. First I'll introduce John Kim, who is currently the Director of Storage Marketing at NVIDIA. John has a rich background in storage and has spent years at Dell EMC and at NetApp where he has built technology and solution partnerships. Next we've got Phil Caton. Phil is a senior staff engineer at Intel where he leads research and development on non-volatile local and remote storage and fabric technologies. Phil has over 24 years experience in software design and has been granted over 23 patents. Next up is Ilker Sibley. Ilker is a senior Director of Product Planning and at Samsung. He has spent over 25 years in the data center and enterprise computing, storage, networking, and memory industries, working in various roles. He's currently at Samsung, where his responsibilities include leading SSD networking, including NVMe over fabric, security, and software-defined storage solutions and technologies. And last, we have David Patterson. Uh, David is a principal engineer at Broadcom, where he's involved with standards development through the International Committee for Information Technology Standards. This includes T10, T11, IETF, IEEE, NVMe Express, and others. David has also been granted several patents in his name. You can see we have a quality uh, uh, individual for this day, and they look, look forward to hearing from them. Next, we just go through a little legal stuff. This is what our lawyers make us say. This shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, just a standard legal talk. The material that you're seeing today is copyrighted by SNEA and the use of material within the presentation is permitted as long as the slides are reproduced in their entirety and SNEA is referenced as your source. And also please be aware that there are no warranties, expressions, or implied information in this presentation. Use it at your own risk. And before we get started in this presentation, I'd just like to cover something real quick in regards to SNEA who is sponsoring this uh, presentation today. First, SNEA is a global industry organization who is chartered with advancing the adoption of storage networking. Within the charter, it is to remain vendor neutral, with represent, and we have representation from over 185 industry-leading organizations and over 2,000 active contributing members. As a global organization, SNEA uh, reaches over 500,000, um, 50,000, I'm sorry, end users worldwide and focus on standard adoption and education. And one more slide before we go over here. Just, uh, this is just a list of a few of our topics that are going to be covered under the SNEA framework. Uh, everything from networking to storage protocols to storage architectures and virtualization to software-defined solutions. Real quick, I just covered the agenda before we introduce our first pre presenter. 
Uh, on the agenda today, first we're going to be covering a brief history of infamy over fabrics. Uh, what is the new role of infamy over fabrics, including support for controller memory buffers and persistent memory regions? We'll then jump into managing and provisioning infamy over fabric devices with Swordfish. We'll go over the background and problem statement for FC NVMe 2. And then we'll go talk a little bit about the fiber channel transport connections over NVMe over fabric, as well as sequence level air recovery for fiber channel, and then the current status of FC NVMe 2 standard. With all that stuff out of the way at this point, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, John Kim. John, take it away. Thank you, Tim. Hello, everybody. So I'm going to give a quick overview of, on what's new in the NVMe over Fabrics 1.1 specification. So first, quickly, for those of you, a quick refresher, why do we need NVMe over Fabrics? And the quick answer is that NVMe, the Non-Volatile Memory Express standard, is very popular, but it itself is a local standard accessed with PCIe for local storage. And it's popular, but you can't always use local storage. Sometimes network storage is better. Network storage allows you to do better sharing and provisioning. It uh, makes more sense in the cloud or with virtualization and containers. It makes it easier to migrate workloads or backup data or to use data efficiency techniques. So there has been a need to use NVMe commands, but run them over a network, over a fabric, and have shared network storage. So a brief history of the fabric standard, the NVMe protocol, and which also runs over fabrics, uh, was first started in 2011 and has progressed most recently, changing with version 1.4 in June of 2019. NVMe over fabrics was first approved in 2016, starting with RDMA, and then it added support for fiber channel with FC NVMe, and then support for TCP IP in 2018. Uh, the standard was published in 2018 and officially became part of the NVMe over fabrics 1.1 spec in October of 2019. So what's new? What we have is actually a combination of things that are new in NVMe over fab sorry, NVMe 1.4, which also applies to fabrics, and then we have things that are specifically new in NVMe over fabrics 1.1. So in 1.1 we have the TCP transport option. We have some multipathing improvements. We have changes or improvements in the discovery and transport side. And then there are also uh, new capabilities for CMB, controller memory buffer, and PMR, persistent memory regions, in SSDs. And those can be used with NVMe or NVMe over fabrics. Ilker will talk more about that. There are additional changes and improvements in FC NVMe. David will talk about that. And then there are some new capabilities or emerging capabilities for manageability using Redfish and Swordfish, and Phil will cover that. So you can see that for some of the specific changes in NVMe over fabrics, I've listed the TP numbers, that's technical proposal. Those are the fabrics TP numbers, and then changes in NVMe have a different set of TP numbers in NVMe 1.4. So just one slide about NVMe over fabrics with TCP. There is a whole separate webcast on this, which is linked here below, so we won't go into a lot of details. But briefly, there are customers who want to run NVMe over fabrics, but they are not ready to run RDMA or not ready to run fiber channel, or they can't extend PCIe. So PCIe is great for local, but it has very a lot of limitations on how far you can extend it or how much you can scale beyond the box or beyond the rack. RDMA is great, but it does require special hardware uh, for the best performance. And Fiber Channel is also great, but it requires a Fiber Channel network. That's great if you have one, but for some customers who don't have Fiber Channel, uh, it may be an obstacle if they don't have a Fiber Channel set up already. TCP, on the other hand, is available everywhere and with the proper setup, it can provide very, pretty good performance or very good performance. So for more details, see the SNEA webcast. The link is here, and you can search for it on Bright Talk or on the SNEA NSF uh, webpage. Now, specifically, what's changed in NVMe over fabrics? So first, there's the multipath capability. This was added in NVMe 1.1, but at that time, it assumed that you had that every controller and every path is identical, and you could not express a preference for which path to be used. Starting with NVMe 1.4, there's asymmetric namespace access. This means you can have two paths to a namespace, and you can, the paths do not have to be equal. The paths or controllers can be different, and you can have a preference for which one to use. So if they're both available, you can say, I want to use path A, 
And only if path A is, uh, becomes unavailable would I use path B. Domains and divisions allow you to take an NVMe subsystem and subdivide it into different domains. And then you can power on or reboot or manage or fault or disconnect uh, individual domains without killing the entire subsystem. So this is really good if you have a large NVMe subsystem. Uh, it's good for non-disruptive operation. And these larger systems that want to have separate domains and divisions are more likely if you have an array connected with NVMe over fabrics. They can exist locally with NVMe as well, but they're just more likely to happen and more likely to be used if you have a larger array with consolidated storage connected using fabrics. So a brief illustration showing this. On the left side, we have uh, asymmetric namespace access. So I could have a host. The host on the left is connected by a pink path and a green path to namespace one. And you can see that it's going through two different controllers, and the controllers are different. Maybe controller B is more powerful or has can give better performance or is the preferred path. So in this case, you can select the green and pink paths do not have to be equal, and we could indicate that the host on the left prefers to use the green path unless it's unavailable, and then it will use the pink path. So that's the case of asymmetric namespace access over fabrics. On the right side, we have an example of uh, domains and how you could have a fault or a, a reboot of just one domain. So let's say I have this connection. I'm connected to, uh, I have a big controller. It has three domains, but then a problem happens, and we have a problem with domain three. So before, uh, I, we would have to uh, basically kill the whole subsystem and restart all the domains so any of the other hosts that were connected to domains one and two would also lose their connection temporarily. But now, we can reboot just domain number three and restart. We could disconnect it and restart it and then remove the fault and restore everything. And all the while, any I.O. or queues that are going to domains one and two would continue uninterrupted. Okay. And finally, uh, the, my last slide, other changes uh, focus on discovery and transport. So there's now a persistent controller discovery, or actually it's a persistent discovery controller. Uh, so in NVMe over Fabrics 1.0, you connected to a discovery controller. It told you what type of storage was out there and available, and it was a one-time deal. If anything changed, you would have to make a new connection and do a new discovery. Now you can have a persistent connection. You can keep it. The host can say, "Keep my connection to the discovery controller alive," and I want to. Be, and the discovery controller can send uh, can send asynchronous notifications the host, letting them know if there are new resources, for example, more storage or more SSDs available uh, through that controller. On the IOQ side, we can have a graceful disconnection of one IOQ without terminating the association or the connection. So in the past, if I have many, you know, it supports many queues, if I lost, if one queue misbehaved or got stuck, I would have to kill the entire connection between that host and that controller and restart it. Now I can kill just the one queue that's misbehaving, and the other queues can continue processing I.O. for other VMs or other containers. And this is great for availability and for managing, again, large systems typically seen with NVMe over fabrics. Other minor changes uh, is, and these are pretty specific and minor and narrow, but the submission queue flow control is now optional. The reason is a lot of people weren't using it because the lower level transports being used for NVMe or Fabrics had their own flow control. So it was previously required, but since people weren't using it, they have now made the submission queue flow control optional. And then RDMA queue pairs, which only applies when using RDMA for NVMe or Fabrics. When you set up those queue pairs, you can now specify a controller ID, which you previously could not do. So that wraps up my section, and we'll go back to Tim, or I guess on to uh, Ilker, to talk more about these topics. Oh, thanks, John. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, join our webcast. I'm Elker Sibeli from Samsung. Um, on my section, uh, I will talk relatively new usages of MMR fabric with uh, CMB uh, and PMR. In other words, they are called control memory buffer and persistent memory region. Um, in the past, uh, there have been a few talks in the CNEA and other uh, forums uh, about the CMB usage, but not so much on the PMR, which is relatively new introduced in the MVME 1.4 uh, as, uh, as an optional feature. And we want to talk about the usages, uh, how this is related to the MVME fabrics. So one of the changes happened in the uh, MVME 1.4 is uh, it is mandatory 
if the controller supports CMB or PMR, the set the uh, registers uh, uh, as uh, if set the one, uh, the controller and host uh, is aware of the control memory buffer exists, and as well as the memory uh, uh, persistent memory region is uh, exists in the controller. So what is uh, what is what is a CMB a control memory? So CMBs were introduced back in the uh, standard in 2014 in the 1.2 version. Uh, control memory buffer is a region for uh, general purpose read-write memory on the controller, and it's a volatile uh, PCI based register. Uh, in other words, bar can be used for data and commands. The main purpose of the CMB is to provide an alternative to uh, so for example, placing queues in the host memory or placing data for DMA in the host memory. Uh, so the benefits are uh, this, this way you can reduce the latencies and allow the desegregation from CPU and PCI bandwidth and the memory utilization. And the control, uh, like I said earlier, the controller indicates which purposes the memory may be used by setting the support flag in the CMB register. Uh, this way, the host is aware there's a CMB uh, uh, CMB uh, control memory buffer exists in the uh, in the SST controller. The PMR is uh, is introduced in the MME uh, 1.4a. Uh, is an optional region, uh, general purpose uh, uh, read-write persistent memory that may be used for variety purposes, and this is a non-volatile and can be used for data. And this provides the internal memory to host and guarantee persistency, and also enables the memory map I.O. for byte accessible uh, accesses through the PCI interface. And this uh, air, uh, region is also power loss protection. In case the power loss, PMR data saved to the NAND or other uh, media. Uh, main uses of PMR and CMB can be, for, especially for non-volatile CMBs, a lock for software RAID erasure coding systems, for instance, for journal, for file system, and metadata storage, and even for RDMA transactions, which is the, what we're going to talk about uh, with the MMR fabrics. So if you look at the CMB, uh, Placing some of the uh, MVME queues in CMB uh, rather than the host memory, it, it reduces the latency. Our DMA NICs can push the data directly to the MVME CMB's uh, PCIe uh, uh, address space, and this could work as a write-back cache. And this, uh, by doing this, you can offload the CPU memory, main memory and reduces the MVME or fabric latencies. And also, if now imagine uh, this area is a persistent and and used as a temporary buffer. PMR can provide remote access to byte addressable persistent data by using the RDMA verbs. And other uh, and in a high side, this all, uh, reduces the latencies and CPU offload. And I will hand it over to Phil. Hello, this is Phil Caton with Intel. Let's stay here scrolling forward. So NVMe, it provides high performance, highly parallel, low latency access to non-volatile memory. Fine. NVMe or fabrics, it builds on the base NVMe architecture to provide virtual representations of non-volatile memory resources and extends the efficiency of NVMe over fabrics. With these advantages, comes a lot of complexity, a lot of moving parts, a lot of components. As you start to scale up, it becomes difficult to configure and provision and administrate, even for you know, really very simple configurations. When you scale to larger and more complex and dynamic installations where you have components that come and go, change configurations, storage devices come and going, where the network, the network infrastructure and the paths change, where usage models and data sets change, it becomes even more complex. If you were to ask someone to draw a systems configuration, you might get a high-level picture such as this, and that with your, your computer system and your fabrics devices and your storage devices, and it's not wrong. 
but there's really more than meets the eye here. Uh, somewhat more accurate, but still not nearly complete. The picture might look more like this. You have lots of features and components, each with their own properties and configuration knobs, and many have their own sensors, and this is all needs to be administrated, and there's relationships between them that needs to be uh, administered. What we need is a storage management model, one that enables efficiently managing the relevant components at a system scale. What we need is a storage management model that encompasses converged and hyperconverged and hyperscale and cloud usages. So how do we solve this? Well, we, in, order to, uh, in order to manage NVMe and NVMe fabric devices and systems in large scale and dynamic environments, we need a higher level management ecosystem, if you will. We need to extend traditional storage domain coverage to converged enterprise environments with servers and storage and fabrics and the relationships between them. We need to represent a unified view of all NVMe device types and the relationships and how they all, all work together and, and cooperate. And we need to do this, and this is the important part, from the point of view of what a client needs to accomplish, what their specific usage is, what their specific data set is, only provide the information the specific clients and usage models need in order to administrate what they need as they need it. So, and that's where we start talking about Redfish and Swordfish. So, the Redfish and Swordfish specifications define logical fabric management model. And Swordfish help, uh, provides a model that can be used for NVMe and NVMe or fabrics management. It's a model that allows for management of the various NVMe and NVMe fabrics uh, types. Uh, for, for instance, for NVMe fabrics, RDMA and TCP and fiber channel right now. Swordfish is designed to integrate with the technologies used in cloud data center environments and accomplish a broad range of storage management tasks, from the most simple configuration to the most advanced and dynamic. Swordfish is developed as a management model from the point of view of what a client needs to accomplish, only put in the functionality that clients have use cases for, only include NVMe and NVMe Fabric properties that clients care about. So. If, you, if there's a property in, in the NVMe or NVMe or fabric specification and you as a client don't need that property, it, it doesn't need to be included in your specific configuration. So Swordfish, it, it leverages and extends Redfish. It uses the Redfish RESTful interface over HTTPS and JSON format based on OData. And Swordfish is implemented as an extension of the Redfish API. Swordfish is it's focused on the joint work to bring the DMTF and the SNEA and the NVMe standards together in order to provide and enable management of NVMe and NVMe devices in large scale dynamic environments. Oh, goodness, I, uh, yes, so if we were to take one little, one little uh, component of that big system and, and look at it from a swordfish point of view or a redfish point of view, but swordfish here, let's take a look at the, uh, the storage subsystem. And you have this schema file, the, the JSON file. And this is a very small piece of it. I know it's, it's, it's tiny, and I apologize. But all it really does is it, it defines what this component is and the interaction of it with, with other pieces it needs to interact with and the mandatory features and, and, pro, and properties that, are, that it needs and the, uh, the optional properties that a user wants to configure for this particular component. So, if we were to uh, dive deeper into how Swordfish fits into and extends Redfish, let's, let's go into this picture here. There we are. So this diagram, uh, there are several versions of this diagram, but this diagram is really trying to show how Swordfish is structured and how it fits into the Redfish model. Redfish is laid out into the logical systems and physical systems and managers. Uh, Redfish provides an infrastructure management view. It, it enables systems and component and management using you know, systems and chassis and fabrics and local storage as represented by the circles in the diagram. Again, apologize for the small picture. But if you were to look at uh, one of the lower uh, gray boxes on the left, that's, you know, it's, a, it's an implementation of a chassis, instantiation of a chassis with its things, what sensors it has, what LEDs, what you know, thermal you know, things that need to be administrated. So how does you know, Swordfish fit into, into Redfish? So, Swordfish adds, uh, well, let's start over. Redfish is laid out in a logical systems with physical systems and managers, and, and Redfish provides the infrastructure management view. Uh, so 
Storage just extends the logical systems by extending a registered local storage management as a starting point to add logical components that we need to manage enterprise storage, including you know, NVMe and NVMe fabrics, as represented by, the, by these blue boxes. And, and we'll get into more of those uh, in the next few slides. So the Swordfish, is, again, it leverages the Redfish protocols and base schema and only adds the, the schema and extends the schema to address enterprise storage services. But together, they form a more comprehensive enterprise storage ecosystem. We have, if you look at the blue boxes, the storage pools for scalability and aggregation of volumes. We have consistency groups for data protection. We have storage groups and endpoint groups for connectivity as uh, you scale larger for connecting external storage uh, into fabrics. We have mapping and masking to include the devices the host can see volumes. And we have file systems, of course, for file management. So diving into NVMe and, and NVMe or fabrics uh, through Redfish Swordfish, so native NVMe and NVMe or fabrics management models, they don't provide a, a data center level view to enable scale out management. You know, they have, they have a good command set, but in order to enable data center views, we need to integrate NVMe and NVMe or fabrics into environments already covered by Redfish and Swordfish. And the next few slides are really going to tie Redfish and Swordfish into NVMe and NVMe or Fabrics, and you'll see how they fit together. You'll show how uh, Redfish and Swordfish provide ecosystem view to enable scale-up management of NVMe and NVMe or Fabrics. So this diagram reflects a high-level mapping of the key in, uh, NVMe objects into Redfish and Swordfish schema objects. So you can you can see the the on the left, you have redfish swordfish and, and what they represent from a management point of view. And on the right, the white boxes represent the NVMe components, or at least some of them. Uh, one of the nice things about the model is you can use really as much or as little as you need for installation. And, you know, for today, the vast majority of the SSDs probably don't need much more than this. But as you scale out and you scale up, you see more complex mappings of the key uh, non bottle memory uh, uh, red, uh, objects into Redfish and Swordfish schema. And this model covers a wide range of installations covering you know, individual SSDs all the way to multi-rack SSDs. And you can see the blue boxes where we have storage groups and, and they map into you know, endurance groups and sets and volumes for namespaces and, and that sort of thing. So now let's go into a slightly more complex picture for NVMe or fabrics. But remember, this is things you've seen before. It looks more complex, but we're just building on it. This diagram builds on and extends novel memory subsystem model to add for the logical versions of objects and thus supporting NVMe or fabrics. It shows a high level mapping between key NVMe or fabrics objects to Redfish and Swordfish scheme objects and how NVMe or fabrics logical resources map onto and extend the regular NVMe model. So on the left, you see a, a gray shaded portion of the diagram, and it reflects the logical and exported portions of NVMe or fabrics environments as represented in Redfish and Swordfish. And the bluish boxes on, on the left side in gray uh, reflect how NVMe or fabrics devices are represented it, it really exactly as local or physical NVMe devices are. That's sort of the point of NVMe or fabrics. And the model also shows in the reddish uh, boxes on the left the uh, their use of the Redfish fabric model to cover uh, the connectivity of fabrics aspects in NVMe or fabrics. And the whole thing reflects a devices model. Again, you use the components you need, and they map into the Redfish Swordfish schema, and you map in only the pieces that are required and that you need. And that really brings us to uh, what's going on now. So in June, uh, not too long ago, we released the uh, the model overview, which contains mockups of use cases and schema with, with new NVMe or fabrics and uh, NVMe specific properties and models for NVMe and NVMe or fabrics. And there's resources. Here's a couple, here's a couple of, uh, of links to a lot of material. And, and of course, those, those links contain more material. But what's going on now is we're developing detailed model overviews and mapping documents to map properties between Redfish and Swordfish and NVMe and NVMe or fabrics. So, we can understand if you're if you're managing from Redfish Swordfish, what property in NVMe and NVMe fabrics are you trying to to, to understand uh, to use, and where in the various specifications can you find those? And so you can you can map back and forth between Redfish Swordfish and NVMe and NVMe fabrics. Also, uh, we're you know we're including usage guidelines where we think we have usage models, and where you know people have said back that oh this is something we need or want. And uh, this is all being developed within the NIA scalable storage management twig in alignment with NVMe and DMTF, because as I said, we're trying to leverage the joint work 
of all of the, the three various specifications. So also, and what's, what's, we're developing redfish and swordfish profiles for specific configurations where, uh, where required option schemas and properties for implementations. And, uh, and, and there's a, a performance test program which has been developed and it is being uh, enhanced and, and developed for the, the uh, new model overviews and stuff that's just come out that will allow manufacturers to test their products with a vendor neutral open source test suite. And that comes to the end of uh, my material for today. Dave, you're up next, or? Next here, okay. Thank you, Bill and uh, hello, everyone. Hope you all are doing well these days, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to provide information on new functionality called sequence level error recovery that was recently added to the NVM Express over fiber channel standard revision two, which has an acronym of FC NVME 2. In this presentation, I'll provide some background on NVMe over fabrics, an overview of fiber channel data transfer basics, the problems that needed to be solved, the solution for fiber channel, and I'll end with a summary and current status. Uh, please note that this presentation is from a very high level and does not do a deep dive into fiber channel sequence level error recovery. With that said, A bit on NVM Express or Fabrics Basics before we begin. The diagram on this slide illustrates the functional pieces in an NVMe over Fabrics environment. We're at the NVM Express level. We've got relationships that exist between a host and an NVM subsystem, which is the target in this context. This is indicated by the red line. And we got associations and IO connections existing between NVMe over fabrics endpoints. This is uh, indicated by the blue line. And then we got the transport that actually provides the actual link between an NVMe host and NVMe subsystem slash target. This is indicated by the green line. Bottom line, all these pieces need to exist, or in other words, all of the stars need to align for NVMe over fabrics to work. For some background and context, the initial NVMe over fabric spec required an association to be terminated if the transport connection is lost for an admin queue or any associated IO queue. In other words, an error at the transport level for an admin queue or any associated IO queue connection results in the termination of the association. Note this is what we call the, the big hammer approach. Did I go too far? Nope. Uh, some more background here. As John mentioned in his What's New in NVMe over Fabrics 1.1 presentation, the ability to disconnect a single I.O. connection was added, thus providing more slash better error recovery granularity. Or in other words, the ability to disconnect a single I.O. connection allows the NVMe over Fabrics association to remain in place if an error occurs on an I.O. connection and the I.O. connection can simply be recreated. Note this is what we call a smaller hammer. And moving on to some fiber channel basics. So what makes a fiber channel transport connection? We've got uh, three fundamental constructs. These are frames, sequences, and exchanges where a frame contains data to be transferred. A sequence is a set of one or more related data frames. And then exchange is one or more sequences for a single operation. For example, an NVMe command, any associated data, and the status response. And so what's so special about an exchange? In this context, uh, an exchange is an interaction between two fiber channel ports to send information and data. 
many fiber channel protocols, including the SCSI-based fiber channel and FCNVME, use an exchange as a single command response protocol. Note it is important, it's important to note individual frames within the same exchange are guaranteed to be delivered. That is an important thing to note here. And also note, with exchange-based routing in effect, individual exchanges may take different routes through the fabric, or different routes through the fabric allows the fabric to make efficient use of the multiple paths between individual fabric switches. So how does fiber channel perform error recovery in an NVMe over fabrics environment? In the beginning, the first uh, FC NVMe standard specified no capability to recover from an error in an exchange. It means any error on admin queue or associated IOQ transport connection causes the NVMe associated to be terminated. And the association of all IO connections then need to be recreated for IO to resume. Again, this is the big hammer approach. Thus, Houston, we have a problem. This big hammer air recovery approach does not work well for most fiber channel deployments, and exchanges may be delivered out of order with exchange-based routing, which means using an exchange to determine the status of another exchange is problematic as the exchanges may be delivered out of order, resulting in improper air recovery and potentially bad things. Therefore, we need a new functionality. And the solution for fiber channel is to simply perform all air detection recovery within the exchange. And uh, sequence low air recovery, which we call SLAIR, was developed. Summary, uh, sequence level error recovery provides the ability to detect and recover from lost commands, lost data, lost status responses, and more importantly, not return a transport level error to the NVB host. Also, another notable feature of SLAIR that was added is the ability for the target to send an error detected message to the initiator, providing an earlier indication of an error versus waiting for the initiator to perform error detection recovery. It is always better to initiate error recovery as soon as possible. An example is the target detecting lost data during a write operation. The bottom line is, all efforts to recover from errors during exchange for an NDME command are performed with the goal of, again, not returning a transport level error to the host. So what does this all mean for NVMe over fabrics? It means there's no need to use the big hammer approach for the transport connection error anymore. In other words, a smaller hammer can be used, which is a good thing. And we got errors within a fiber channel exchange can now be recovered, thus preventing an error to be returned to the NVMe host that causes the association or IO connection to be terminated. And in the past, even resilient multiple paths could not prevent an association to be terminated upon an error. The good thing, and now we can keep multiple paths resilient, and again, all the stars are aligned. And finishing up. In summary, the ability to seamlessly recover from a fiber channel transport level error in an exchange-based routing environment has been standardized for use in NVMe over fabrics environments. And this is a really good thing. Current status is the FC NVMe 2 standard is published and available via the Insights website. And in addition, a draft standard document is posted on the Insights T10 website. This document is called F or Fiber Channel Protocol for SCSI-5, revision 01. This is also widely known as FCP-5. Important thing is that you know, we got work underway to add the sequence level error recovery functionality as optional behavior for the FCP realm. I hope this presentation was beneficial to you all. Feedback and questions are most welcome. 
and I will turn it over to Tim. Thank you. Great, thanks. We do have a few questions here and encourage uh, others who have questions to go ahead and start typing them now. There seems to be quite a few around uh, CMB and, and PMR, so these might fall on Ilker and uh, John. First question, any special actions are required on the host side over controller memory buffers to maintain the data consistency? Yeah, uh, so this is Ilker. Let me, uh, and John can add uh, to my comments. So yes, there are uh, for data consistency to, to prevent the uh, possible uh, misdirection. Uh, in the case of uh, to uh, to have a data consistency, before anything, the host uh, software has to enable the CMB control memory uh, space, and by doing that, host should uh, would configure the CMB's control address range, and. Uh, so the addresses uh, do not overlap any address the whole software may intend to use as a DMA. Uh, that's one of the methods, and that's described in the, on the spec, in the latest spec. John, did you want to add anything? Okay. Is, there, is there also a, a question, a flush command that allows the host to specify that data written to the CMB uh, is flush to persistent memory or to? Uh, yeah, that's called uh, persistent memory status. It, it, I think you're, that's what you're talking about. Uh, that uh, the status register, that uh, the host acknowledged that the data is being uh, uh, is flushed to the persistent memory region, is, or I, I should say, is a valid, valid comment. That's also Excellent. described okay. in the PMR specification. Yep. Okay, that makes sense. Tim. Great, thanks. Next question is, is there a field to know the size of CMB and PMR which are supported by controllers? And if so, what is the general size of CMR in the current devices? Yeah, let me address the last one first. Uh, so uh, the general size of the uh, CMB in current devices, it's vendor specific. Uh, I will not, uh, it varies from vendor to vendor. But uh, there is a field uh, in the CMB uh, and uh, PMR, uh, and both of those are defined in the spec. Uh, the CMB size is indicated by the what is called CMB is size register, and the PMR is the same uh, way is a, P, uh, P, a PMI, uh, PMR register uh, defines the uh, the size of the PMR region. Okay, any other, Tim? Yep, a few more questions. Let's uh, next question up there. Does PMR guarantee that write requests to the PMR region have been committed to media, even though they have not been acknowledged before the power fail? And follow along to that, is there a max time limit in in the spec within which MDB, MVME devices should recover after power failure? Yeah, so that, uh, again, I'm going to address the, the last portion of the time limit as a re very vendor implementation specific. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the implementation is uh, to ensure the, uh, uh, the re uh, rights are uh, valid and the host reads the PMR status register. This will allow the host to ensure the previously issued memory rights of the PMR have completed and, and, and determine the PMR associated with the um, uh, so without an uh, error, and the data is persistent. Is there an average latency as well when oh, using that, NVMe over Fabric yeah. Uh Average latency is, depends on the uh, vendor implementation. So, so there's no. Yeah, latency uh, depends on the. Yeah, the latency depends on the. The media, so the SSD, the SSD, and then it depends on the type of network you have in between, and also they're different the way you implement it. So you can have some parts of the NVMe protocol normally run in software, but in some cases could be offloaded to part to the adapter. Uh, so it varies. I think the specific question asks what happens if an unladen swallow is attempting to fly using NVMe or Fabrics 1.1. Uh, in that case, it really depends on how far the swallow is flying. Uh, and then how fast the swallow goes, because the swallow may not be able to travel over the actual network connection. Yep. 
And another question here, is there an implementation of NVMe over fabrics with direct CMB access? Do you want to take that, John? Okay, actually, I was thinking you should take that, but it was the, I believe, uh, okay, so you said first CMB was supported with NVMe, starting with NVMe 1.2, correct? Yes. Uh, and so I believe you can, it can run over, you can use it over NVMe or Fabrics right now. You need an SSD yes. that supports it, and you need a, a, ne a network transport setup that supports it, which you talked about in your slide. So I think the answer yeah. is it's available uh, now in NVMe over Fabrics 1.1. Uh, yeah, if you have the right, if you have the right kind of SSD that supports it. That's right. So you can do um, the RDMA uh, writes into the CMB uh, uh, submission queues, uh, commands, command and data uh, air, uh, region. So uh, this is already supported by the latest spec uh, 1.1, and as well as the NVMe 1.4 A spec. I think there's a question for David about the fiber about fiber channel NVMe. Yeah, I see if there are several sequence level errors, how can we correct the errors in the appropriate order? Uh, it's all basically everything's done in the sequence. So the first thing it's done is uh, you check for this if the command made it across, and you wait for a response and uh, determine uh, if you lost data or not, and then. Uh, you're waiting for the response, so everything is basically in order. And uh, let me know if that doesn't answer the question. All right, let's move on. We had a couple other ones in. Doesn't RDMA provide an implicit queue on the controller side, negating the need for CMB for queues? Can the CMB also be used for data? CMB can be used for data, as I mentioned, um, but CMB also can be used for commands, for queues. Um, yeah, Elker, I think you, you covered that in the slide, and I think the answer is with the queues, uh, and I don't think this is exclusive to RDMA. The, the queues normally, if you don't have CMB, the, yeah, the queues are managed by RDMA, but they're managed normally in host memory, uh, mm -hmm. or in some cases they might, some adapters might be able to run it on the adapter, but the whole point of CMB is that you, by putting, if you put the queue in the CMB, then you get some performance advantages. Oker, is that correct? Yes, yes, you, you, you nailed it, yes. Great. Two more questions here. Uh, next one, what's the difference between PMR and NVMe devices and the persistent memory in general? I think that will require a whole different webcast, probably. Uh, so the PMR <laughs> is essentially uh, a PMR. It's a region within the SSD uh, controller. It's a persistent uh, region uh, in the SSD controller, MME uh, SSD, SSD controller. Um, a persistent memory, I think, this has been referred in general as a system level. Uh, so all different uh, definitions and usages. Uh, so I will refer uh, to another section or another webcast probably. And we usually do follow-up webcasts, so that may be a, a good one for us to follow up with. Yep. Uh, next question, what is the ballpark latency between the CMB and PMR access? Can you provide a number based on assumptions that both of these are accessed over RDMA fabric? Uh, as I stated earlier, this is very implementation uh, and media uh, dependent. Uh, we won't be able to comment on that unless, John, you have a ballpark on the RDMA or MME or fabrics. I don't have a specific uh, – let me look at that question here. I don't have a specific number to share other than uh, when you're using CMB. Again, generally it gets faster. Latency goes down and – uh, the, the performance for certain types, especially for small operations or random I.O. can go up. Uh, but I don't have a, a specific number. We, I think we, we may have some testing ongoing or some, some results, but I don't have them available right now. 
Next question is sort of similar here as far as they're looking for performance of NVMe over TCP in terms of IAPS as compared to NVMe over RDMA. Oh, I can take that one. Uh, well, it, <laughs> it is heavily implementation dependent, and as I mentioned, NVMe over TCP can get pretty good. Uh, if you give you know the same network speed and similar hard same SSDs, uh, it's going to be better with if you run it over RDMA. But how much better kind of depends on the I/O size and what what types of offloads are available, uh, because different types of RDMA adapters do different kinds of offload, and there are also some adapters that will do some offload for NVMe over TCP. So the uh, again, generally, the, the general answer is NVMe over TCP is going to be a little higher latency and a little lower IOPS, but it can be pretty close to an RDMA implementation, uh, especially if you have uh, if you have some hardware offloads for the TCP part. Great, thanks, John. The last question seems like we've got now: How could we control the right order for the error correction? I'm assuming that's uh, talking about the fiber channel stuff. Uh, the, the order for error corrections is all based on the information returned from the target, given that state and what the initiator state is. Um, there was a, a message sent from the initiator to the target within the exchange that provides that information. Those are further details that be more than happy to provide if people are interested down the road. We can also expand on that within the blog if that's a appropriate place to do it as well. Uh, and that's the end of the questions we have here, guys. Thanks. Big thanks to all the presenters here today. And uh, a few follow-up things just to finish. After the webcast, as we mentioned at the beginning, please rate us and provide us with the feedback. They'll help us improve further uh, webcasts in the future. Uh, there are also uh, slides are available. If we saw some people did download those, uh, 41 of them. So, um, and then uh, questions and answers from the webcast will be posted to the SNEA blog site. You can see the link right there as well. And please follow us on Twitter as well if you're interested in this, um, these presentations. We do have others as well up on the SNEA website. We encourage you to look through some of our archives and see if there's anything of interest to you there. Hope that you join us in a future webcast. Thanks, for everybody, for joining. And thanks again to the presenters. Excellent job. Thank you. Have a good day.